good morning i'm standing here with immense pleasure because i have to on behalf of my department i have to thank my beloved teacher jansi teacher and my beloved friend kalyani and we are going to hear uh, kalyani soon so uh jansi teacher was my guide at the institute of english and now i am dr tk rajendran just because of her blessings and support and uh, a great teacher a great human being compassionate a great administrator a great academic and a great uh, uh, you know scholar so she is all this and you know i uh, got her signature on my uh, thesis before its final submission um, just one day after the death of her beloved mother so she was that much considerate and that is why i told you that today i am dr tk rajendra just because of her blessings and uh, support and so today a teacher has given us a wonderful talk on the wasteland and now i am teaching uh, the wasteland in our ma class and this talk is very useful to us very informative enlightening to both myself and my kids uh, so thank you teacher on behalf of the department i and then uh, we i have to thank our principal he was presided over the meeting um, and he is the leader of our team definitely but on formality sake i uh, you know extend i extend a hearty vote of thanks to sir also and now uh, we have a very unexpected guest of honor parishan uh, sir kalyani's father he was our principal principal of university college and so it was a immense pleasure that i you know extend uh, our sincere love and gratitude to you sir and kalyani was a close friend a batch mate and we did phd together at the institute and uh, she was a great academician a brilliant teacher and she is known all over india for her br brilliant classes a celebrity in academics <laughs> so i thank her on behalf of the department of english and now our hod pravina teacher she is the organizer of this meeting but still as i told you on formality sake i extend my vote of thanks to uh, teacher and then there are teachers from other colleges students from other colleges and other institutions uh, i thank you all for your presence here and the my students at the university college and they were the backbone of this event and uh, this uh, you know is a, this becomes a success just because of their support and participation and on behalf of the department i thank you all once again i thank you all thank you thank you my most beloved ma'am dr jansi james my dear friends friends rajendran pravina and all the faculty members of the department my dear father students i'm so excited because for the first time i'm making a an academic presentation outside my institute of english course before my teacher i feel like i'm going to present a seminar for which ma'am will give me <laughs> marks <laughs> thank you so much ma'am for enabling me to stand here and uh, make this presentation there is a very uncanny similarity between the topics that we are talking about today and this situation again coming back to the presence of my uh, ma'am here what do you get from a teacher many of us uh, had been under the impression 
at some point of our lives that what a teacher gives us is information. But with the coming of Google and the internet, we have probably come to realize that it is not information that you get from a teacher because any teacher is way inferior to the Google in terms of information. But there is something that you never get from the Google uh, that is perspective. And another, I made it up as I was sitting here and listening to ma'am. This was not the original introduction that I had in mind. Uh, another thing that you get from a teacher is the power of reflection. Uh, ma'am herself talked about reflection and uh, in the context of the wasteland. And when you get a perspective and reflection, you get the power of expression. Uh, this is what the wasteland and Ulysses are about. A new way of looking at things. A new way of understanding reality and the world and ourselves. And the more, as, as we know from philosophy, the more we understand, we realize that the less we understand. That is why I titled my presentation, uh, What Do We Know of Ulysses and Ourselves? Because uh, as again, Jan Simam was talking about, there is a kind of universal relevance to these works that were published in 1922 in the context of uh, the post-war period or the post-First World War period and the consequent problems that the world, the Western world especially, faced. But again, in a very uncanny way, we have passed the First World War, we have passed the Second World War. Like we said, we were not born at that time, not even the senior most people here were born at that time. But we are still bearing the consequences of it. And we have passed modernism and reached postmodernism. We have passed postmodernism also. Now we live in a world where again, as ma'am was saying, we long once again for order, for values, for meanings. And uh, there is a return to uh, conservative approaches across the world. Well, well I am a liberal. Uh, when we talk about liberal attitudes, I am a liberal by attitudes, by outlook, but today we have reached a place when we need to look back at our conservative and liberal approaches because the world has gone through so many upheavals in the recent times, in the present also, which makes us rethink what we are, what we know and uh, what our society is. So more than the centenary of two pioneering and uh, path-breaking literary works, I think this moment gives us a, an opportunity to reflect on ourselves too, which is very important. James Joyce is far removed from us. He was born in Ireland and he did not accept Irish values or the values of modernity uh, very much. He lived a very reclusive life, uh, even though Ulysses made him a celebrity. He was a man who did not uh, accept his times, like many of us do not accept our situations, we rebel. We want to establish our individual perspectives, we strive to carve uh, space for ourselves. This is very much related to the, our situation is very much related to, uh, in many ways, the situation of modernism, I think. Again, as we saw in the discussion of the wasteland, there are many things that connect us with the wasteland and Ulysses, such as the experience of fragmentation and decay and decadence. We have lived through a millennium. Many, most of us were born uh, in the previous millennium and having passed that transition, even though we may not have been conscious of it, it was just another year, another day. But it is a period of decadence, like all transitions of centuries and millenniums had been. We are living in a time again of sexual anarchy and uh, frustrated desire of loneliness, of uh, misuse of sexuality and the body of, uh, you know, uh, 
death, a, a prevalent uh, fear of death, which is why there is so much focus on health care and beauty and youthfulness and, um, you know, uh, our civilization is centering on a fear of death still. So all this connects us with these two massive texts and gives us an opportunity to look back upon history and philosophy, which is what these texts are about. Uh, the Wasteland and Ulysses are difficult to understand uh, for us because these are highly scholarly texts that connect with history and philosophy in uh, unimaginable ways. And uh, this is a period, the modernist, modernist period was a period that witnessed the end of humanism, 400 years of humanism from the time of uh, Renaissance had come to a pathetic end because of uh, the socio-political situations of uh, Europe at that time, uh, of which an objective correlative is the First World War. The First World War was not the only disaster, it was a series of upheavals and catastrophes and um, changes, transformations that led James Joyce and T.S. Eliot to write in this manner. In uh, The Wasteland and Ulysses, therefore, we try to redefine ourselves redefine our values, meanings. It is a quest and uh, we live through a similar quest. That is what I was saying. In the early 20th century, there was something called the linguistic turn in Western philosophy, where uh, the understanding of human, human, human being and reality and values all came to be focused upon the language in which we express ourselves. We began to understand at the beginning of the 20th century that language constructs reality and uh, therefore it is multiple. And this leads to an understanding of the incomprehensibility of life and uh, society and this is reflected in literature. So this is why uh, Ulysses and the Wasteland are massive uh, you know, moments in the history of humanity because they reflect a turn, a change in our perceptions and we are still continuing to, uh, to, to, to bear the consequences of that transformation. Like in a traditional uh, class, we have to talk about the author first. Not only because he is the man behind the work, not only because he is the man behind the work, but also because in so many ways, the wasteland is T.S. Eliot and Ulysses is James Joyce. But not in a very realistic, uh, humanistic way. Uh, an author writing about his, uh, his experiences, not in that sense. Within the, within the text of Ulysses, within the novel Ulysses, there is a questioning of um, this autobiographical elements. There is a questioning of what, a deconstruction of what Ulysses means. There is a, an analytical study of Ulysses in a way, in, a, in an indirect way. That is in the famous scene when uh, Stephen Daedalus talks about Shakespeare and Hamlet. There is a fam very famous episode in Ulysses where Stephen and his friends are discussing uh, Shakespeare and Hamlet. It is a, an amazing scene once you read it and understand it. Uh, Stephen is saying that Shakespeare, uh, his life is reflected in Hamlet. You see, Shakespeare acted in the play Hamlet and in the 16th century. Uh, and uh, he was the ghost of King Hamlet. So here is the ghost of the father talking to his son Hamlet. This is what Stephen says. And uh, this is like the dead father talking to the living son is like the living father Shakespeare talking to his son Hamnet, who had just died before Hamlet was written. So this is a novel which is about fathers and sons in so many ways. We know that the whole sen uh, the, the focus of Ulysses, the text, is about Stephen's search for a father figure his mother had just died a year ago and he is feeling guilty about her death. And there is even the statement made by the character Buck Mulligan that Stephen killed his mother. 
and uh, this is of course not literal he killed his mother by going away from her and leaving her alone and she was grieving uh, his absence and she died of it that is the meaning which is what james joyce has also done in life as we know at the end of a uh, portrait of the artist as a young man which is much more autobiographical stephen is leaving ireland for paris uh, stephen is james joyce and uh, as i talk about uh, james joyce's life we will uh, try to understand how his life is connected to portrait and ulysses first uh, about his family i have not put a lot of text in my slides because uh, of the mesmerizing effect of a person talking to us that we just had uh, in the first session uh, it was wonderful that jan jansi ma'am did not use a powerpoint presentation i thought because uh, of that uh, presence of the person uh, the speaking voice which is also relevant to the wasteland and modernism even when we talk about the absence of a human being even when we talk about multiple perspectives one voice the inability of one voice being heard there are so many conflicting voices in both these novels sorry both these texts this novel and the poem even then there is a longing for that voice that person that presence that center that meaning that is at the center of both these texts so luckily this morning i got up and deleted all the text that i had in the slides but uh, fortunately i have a print out of it um, we don't need the text we need the voice perhaps uh, james joyce was born outside of dublin and he was the eldest surviving son of his parents there were 15 children five of them died only 10 were there and he was the man responsible for the family so to say but in portrait of the artist as a young man we see him being disillusioned by his family his religion catholicism his nation ireland and its nationalism and he's moving away from his roots from his identity uh giving up all that he has and going to paris in search of something else it's a quest what did he get from there he went to study medicine but he did not uh become a doctor he could not publish his works at first in the present scenario we would be completely depressed and we would give up writing altogether and it is this depressive a uh, lack of attention or a recognition that ultimately made him james joyce he never really came back and lived in ireland even though he came back briefly he never uh, came back and lived in ireland he lived in the other parts of europe uh, in james joyce's autobiographical novel we also see uh, his family in a very deteriorating condition uh, in terms of finance he f at first attended uh, clongowes wood college he went then he could not continue because of lack of tuition fees then he went to belvedere college then he went to university college dublin and he was a very brilliant student uh, where he engaged in uh, philosophic philosophical and historical discussions with his friends etc who also appear in the ulysses in the novel ulysses but that is the traditional uh, coming of age buildings roman that we expect that is not what portrait of the artist is about it is not about how he went from one college to another college and uh, ultimately left paris it is a subversion of that expected plot portrait of the artist is full of fragmented experiences you see a child's perception of the world slowly developing into confusions and primarily sexual confusion and then slowly slowly he is evolving into a human being a person who is able to talk and do things and get prices and write a poem for emma claire he was not able to do that it is the evolution in another way it's a psychological evolution uh, that that reality of the mind which is not necessarily uh, uh, an, uh, an aristotelian plot which cannot be put into an aristotelian plot that is what the novel portrait of the artist uh, is all about and similarly ulysses is also about a journey of the mind it's a spiritual journey it is a quest you expect a plot so what is the story of ulysses that is what everybody wants to know what really happened in ulysses can we tell can you tell me in five sentences can you give me a summary of it as clean brooks said the greatest literary works of modernism are all unparaphrasable heresy of paraphrase you cannot write a summary of ulysses or the wasteland if you are able to write a summary then 
you are if you are writing a summary then you are taking away the complexity the richness the experience that the text is in short me standing here and trying to talk about ulysses is a criminal uh, you know offense there cannot be a summary or a lecture on this novel because this novel is a world in itself it is an experience it is it has depths like an ocean it is something that you should read not in one day not in one month not in one year not in a course maybe that is why ulysses is not prescribed in courses the practical reason is that it is unteachable the spiritual reason is that it cannot be learned in one day or one year or in one classroom it is an experience of a lifetime and as you know this experience is um, condensed into in a very ironic humorous a uh, satirical manner it is condensed into the plot of another great text uh, homer's odyssey again i am rambling like leopold bloom is rambling stephen dedalus is rambling on 16 june 1904 on that thursday they don't know where they are going they are just going here and there like that i was going to show you talk about the family again i'm rambling but still can you show the next slide i will try to bring okay schooling i already talked about i am deaf I, i i am rambling because this is the only way you can talk about anything not only about ulysses but anything and he went to paris then he came back you can see james joyce there with his friends and during this time he met the love of his life nora barnacle nora barnacle he did not marry at first they had children why he did not marry is because not because he didn't have money but because he didn't believe in the institution of marriage but society even today uh, tries to bring you into the shackles of marriage and he had to marry nora barnacle otherwise his children wouldn't get his inheritance that is why he had to finally marry her and uh, he um, met nora it is that day 16 june that ulysses is set it is that day when uh, nora and joyce met and sorry for the uh, statement that i am going to make uh, but i cannot avoid making it because ulysses is about all this that is the day when nora masturbated him for the first time i think and uh, this is in a very funny uh, probably even disgusting manner me- memorialized in ulysses as that day so what is he doing here he is trying to break all the expectations and the, the the shackles that is the word that i myself used just now uh, that society is pushed into that life is uh, you know molded into this is full of unexpected things this is full of shock this is full of uh, insults this is full of such uh, a surprising playfulness that you feel horrified and disgusted with the text with the author and uh maybe with ourselves for trying to understand it and study it but that is long after ulysses was written i am talking about what happened before ulysses was written why ulysses is written 16 june is crea- uh, celebrated as bloom's day because ulysses was written today we celebrate it for a different reason it is it is like a um, what can i say an institutionalization of ulysses when people ritualistically uh celebrated even this seminar that we have is part of that institutionalization but the text ulysses is beyond that it it is against all institutionalization it is against all expectation and this is why it was banned because it questions like ma'am said it completely unsettles us it gives us a completely new perspective like never before before we never thought of life like this it is like that ulysses is. don't try to bring it into boxes and shackles and it is actually wrong to celebrate even the publication of ulysses in that sense luckily we are not celebrating it on the day it was published as very uh, intelligently we have uh, postponed it to another day because that is again a, an expression of fragmentation perhaps and i was hoping that they will be playing the music there because it will be an the ultimate metaphor for the wasteland and ulysses a very serious discussion is happening here among people who don't know anything about ulysses who have not read ulysses Uh, we don't know why we are studying this and uh, we are all crammed into this big hall i am sweating and uh, we are trying to make sense of it is not the sweating of the weather or the climate 
it is a sweating of trying to understand this text and talk about it and at that time there will be popular music blaring outside and they will be dancing and singing that is that is what is ulysses you understand the incongruity of life the incomprehensibility of uh, of our existence and, uh, and so on and so forth so while uh, so we we reached his life till he met nora and they had an intimate time together later much later it was memorialized as the day in which ulysses is set after a few days uh, before he went away with nora for forever he went and lived in martelot tower for a few days there was a friend uh, who invited him there and that friend is buck mulligan in our ulysses now martelot tower is today joy's tower i have had the good fortune to do a, a road trip of uk and ireland and i went to martelot tower this joy's tower where it is a museum you can see it is a stone tower england is full of such stone towers joy's uh, and uh, wbh especially in ireland uh, in galway etc there are these so many towers and joy's sorry uh, wbh also lived in such a tower which is a famous symbol of the tower and um, in martelot tower ulysses begins it is an ordinary day stephen is living there with his friends buck mulligan and haines and uh, buck mulligan is uh, shaving his mirror is cracked and what discussions they have what talk they have on that day uh, is the beginning of ulysses it is nothing like the greatest uh, novel uh, of the 20th century will be expected to begin like you know this is this is not the beginning that we expect and uh, this cracked mirror in since i mentioned it uh, you stephen says this is like a metaphor for irish art and from the beginning there are so many allusions there are so many connections uh, that maybe we will not understand completely forever they are very obscure some of them there are, there have been annotations and notes and uh, critical commentaries luckily for us so much of it we can understand if we take the effort um, for example if i if i give you one example that i understood and i liked this cracked mirror compared to irish art uh, buck mulligan says is comparable to what oscar wilde said about uh, realism and romanticism uh, in the 19th century there was a lot of resistance against realism oscar wilde said the resistance against realism is like caliban looking at himself in the mirror because when you look at realist works in the 19th century many people did not like it because they saw themselves in the mirror it was very disconcerting it was very uh, disturbing and then he says 19th century's uh, dis, uh, you know dislike of romanticism is like caliban looking at the mirror and not finding himself there that means you want to see yourself in literature we like ulysses when i said ulysses is like us you know there are many values that we still share everybody liked it oh now we found a reference point now we found a connection actually it is sacrilegious to make such connections because ulysses is not about such connections there are no connections possible probably because it is all multiple and uh, shifting and when you look at a romantic text the 19th century bourgeoisie they were not finding themselves there so this is a very interesting uh, analogy that you get in that first episode the can you move uh, the early life in ireland let us take a break and look at joyce and nora and the next slide is uh, the letters 1136 letters that joyce wrote to nora if you google search it and read it you will be scandalized because there is the greatest man of the 20th century who wrote the greatest book of ulysses and it is full of expletives full of uh, you know not even pornography can imagine that kind of writing he himself tongue in cheekly uh, in a tongue in cheek expression called it dirty letters and why is he doing that because sexuality is what we are all about ultimately as ma'am was talking to us about wasteland and classical mythology there is so much in life that is elemental and primitive and primordial that our civilization and culture has kind of negated and silenced and hidden and sexuality is the objective correlative for that real 
of human life that is forever probably lost to us. If you use a Lacanian analogy, the real is forever lost to us. We don't have it. It has been replaced by language. And uh, the modernists used sexuality very aggressively. Uh, in Ulysses also, as I hinted, it is there uh, to show uh, in a very oblique manner what life is about, what man is about. And in Ulysses, after all the wanderings of Leopold Bloom, there is a famous scene that led to the banning of Ulysses. It was being serialized in Little Review uh, at that time. Um, 13 or 18 episodes had already been, no, no altogether there were only 18. 13 episodes had been um, published and then the, uh, the, the, the publishers were put under trial, etc. Because of this scene, this episode, when uh, it is called uh, Nausicaa, uh, where Leopold Bloom has wander, wandered in Dublin, met a lot of people and finally he is coming on Sandy uh, Cove Beach and uh, Sandy Mount Beach and sitting there and looking at some girls and in Odysseus there are Nausicaa and her maidens who uh, guided him back to his house in Ithaca and Ulysses uh, shows Leopold Bloom also reaching a kind of completion there. He is uh, looking at this girl uh, and masturbating and uh, it is a kind of reconciliation that he makes with his own frustrated uh, sexual desire and identity and he returns back home after this to his wife Penelope. Now you are wondering, I didn't talk about the characters, who is Leopold Bloom probably you are wondering, maybe you know, uh, maybe you know why he is frustrated, let us look into that. This is uh, the Joyce Tower, the Martello Tower where uh, the novel begins where I said Stephen is talking to uh, Buck and uh, Haynes and this is his early work that was published in George Russell's uh, I, by you know with the help of George Russell in Irish Homestead. Irish Homestead is not a literary magazine it was about agriculture and other things and George Russell is a writer a poet who called himself A.E., that is a pseudonym, who appears as a character in Ulysses. And um, it is George Russell who helped Joyce publish this work. Like George Russell or A.E., there are so many characters from real Dublin, from real life, that um, Joyce has brought into this novel. Why? Because there is nothing other than your felt experiences, your life which is fragmented, that you can write about. This is, you know, when I came into the college, uh, one, of your teach, one of the teachers of this college asked me, what is this? Is your body a canvas? Uh, he, you know, because of the uh, tattoo that I have. And that suddenly gave me an idea. You know, the only canvas that we have is ourselves, our body, our life, our reality, our felt reality. We, we can't pretend to talk about anything else. Ulysses is full of talk about uh, Aristotle and Aquinas and so is a portrait of the artist as a young man. There are so many philosophical connections, but ultimately it's all about ourselves and our inability to know ourselves. And Ulysses was finally serialized, as I told you, in 1914, published by Sylvia Beach in France. You can look at Sylvia, no. Uh, he, he was in Europe at this time. He was uh, living in Trieste and before that, uh, uh, Zurich. Zurich and then he came back to Dublin. In these three places, he was writing Ulysses. It did not happen one fine morning. He was traveling and he wrote it over many years. This is the famous Joyce statue in uh, Trieste in Italy. There are many Joyce statues. There is a famous one in uh, Dublin, Marjorie Gibbon statue. Today, when we talk about a text, we have moved away from the traditional approaches to the text. Today, in our research projects, it is important uh, to talk about the statues, it is important to talk about the book covers that, that you will see in the next slide. Uh, one of your professors has done his research on uh, the, the presentation of books and book covers, uh, things like that I think. And uh, this is all part of the text, it is not only the plot, it is not only the characters, it is also the production and reception of the text uh, that we have to talk about. It's so interesting to look at uh, the, the multifarious ways in which uh, Ulysses has been presented by artists in book covers and in paintings, etc. You can conduct a whole exhibition on it. There are so many of them. And not only the book cover, 
the next slide will show you the page designs. I have just, I did a lot of research on it. I just took symbolically like an objective correlative. Only one uh, of the page designs I found, it's by Ernest Rieck. He is a German book designer and uh, he was active from 1930s to 1970s, it seems. I did not know all this before. I studied for the sake of this lecture, but it was amazing to read about all that. And uh, Ulysses became a sensation. It was first banned as soon as it was published. It was banned in 1922 in UK and US. And in UK, the ban was lifted in 1934. And sorry, US, the ban was lifted in 1934. And in the UK, much later in 1959. And as I was sitting here, I suddenly wondered whether it was banned in Ireland. And I was checking out in Google here whether it was banned in Ireland and I found that in Ireland it was not really uh, sold or it was it, it did not become as much a uh, sensation as, as it was in the rest of the Europe rest of Europe so it was not banned in Ireland it always takes a century to understand a great writer like this and we are at that point one century later probably humanity is ripe uh, to talk about uh, Ulysses and uh, this is Sylvia Beach She's a very important figure in modernism. Uh, she has been involved with many modernist writers and publications. She's the owner of Shakespeare and Company, for which Ezra Pound, uh, you would think he wrote books, but he made furniture for Shakespeare and Company. And uh, next slide. And uh, having written the masterpiece of his life, and he, he was undergoing a lot of uh, personal troubles, including multiple surgeries for his eyes he uh, sat down to write the greatest work of his lifetime he called it his masterpiece and that is Finnegan's Wake it is a, 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 an unteachable uh, text much more than Ulysses's it is a massive text which uh, which plays with identity and names and reality and meanings in unimaginable ways Ulysses is so much better compared to Finnegan's Wake Finnegan's Wake has um, even in Ulysses it is there, uh, surreal uh, elements like uh, you know, inanimate objects taking on animate roles and animate objects becoming inanimate and things like that. There is an episode in Ulysses where a lot of surreal things happen. Just before the, uh, the, the denouement, just before the ending, there is an episode where Stephen and uh, Leopold Bloom are getting into a drunken stupor and getting a lot of hallucinatory experiences which is symbolic of that, um, what can I say, the, you know, in a war or, uh, you know, for example, in Emperor Jones, uh, the tom-tom is beating to a frenzied pace, you know, at, at the end of Emperor Jones, you hear the tom-tom drum being, uh, you know, it is beating very fast, like that a ritualistic climax, let me say, a ritualistic climax is that surrealist experience that Leopold Bloom and Stephen Daedalus undergo uh, in that episode. And uh, this ritualistic climax uh, and very similar connections, I feel, are there in Death of a Salesman also, where also there is uh, a, a subversion of, uh, you know, tragic elements and the celebration of uh, everyday experience. Not in the same way, of course. It is a tragedy of the everyday man, of the everyday life. Like, much like Ulysses also is. It's not a tragedy, but it is a, 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 a text about ordinary people and everyday lives who are not heroic. In that sense, uh, it connects with other modernist novels like, uh, sorry, modernist texts like uh, Death of a Salesman. Next slide, please. And this is Joyce's final resting place. Now, uh, we don't have to talk about Joyce. We have to talk about the text. As you know, Ulysses is about... Um, Dublin. Dublin is almost like a character and we think that Ulysses is all about Stephen, Leopold Bloom and Molly, the three central characters and also Blazes Boylan who is uh, Molly's singing manager. She's a singer and she's having an affair with this man. We think they are the only characters but Ulysses is full of so many characters who just come and go. They are characters whom Leopold Bloom meets on the way. Maybe it is worthwhile to look at Ulysses not as centering on these four human beings but Ulysses as the story of Dublin, as all, a story of all these characters. 
I am reminded of, let me draw a parallel with um, da Dalit literature, which is again a very un, uh, conventional parallel, I guess. In Dalit literature, there are many works, for example, Growing Up Untouchable by Vasant Moon, I think. Uh, there, you have a central protagonist, but there are so many characters of that village coming and going and we don't see them again. It is more like the autobiography of a community than the autobiography of a man. Why is it so? Because mainstream literature centered on man and humanism so much that many voices were not heard, many uh, experiences were brushed under the carpet and uh, it required a new aesthetics. It required a new approach uh, to, for the Dalits to write their experiences and life. Like that, the modernist is moving away in a certain way from the expectations of the human being into, uh, from social society, they are moving inner into the inner reality. From the individual, uh, they are moving into the community in a very, uh, very unique way. Like in the wasteland, even though Tiresias is the protagonist of the wasteland, you can see a little bit of Tiresias in all the characters. All these characters are living a liminal existence, in between existence, neither dead nor living. Death in life is characterizing the wasteland. Like that, there is a little bit of Leopold Bloom and Stephen Daedalus and their quest and their, uh, you know, confusions in all these characters. It is the entire Dublin that um, is presented here. Now, Dublin is a city and in modernism, the in modernism, the metropolis is a very important concept. Uh, I have put a few points here in case you got bored with my personal, uh, sorry, presence and voice. You can look at the slide, I thought. Uh, modernism is considered uh, as an expression of urban life. Urban life where people are wandering and uh, feeling disconnected and they are searching. Modernist writers were all majorly from the small suburbs and uh, the smaller cities. They moved to the big cities of London, Paris, New York, St. Petersburg, etc., where the unreal city, the surreal city, where all these modernist texts are mostly set. Uh, why they did, did they talk about the city? It's because of the anonymity, the darkness, the vastness, and the mechanization of the city. I'm reading from the slide. And also because of the dynamism and energy of the city. So it was an ambivalent relation. It was a uh, love-hate relationship that they had with the city. Next slide. The wanderer in the city is a very famous motif in modernism, the flanier. It has been discussed by many philosophers including Walter Benjamin. The flanier is a wanderer. It is like a window shopper. It, it, a flanier is an idler, a man who is not particularly going anywhere. He is directionless and wandering and uh, he is seeing another side of the city. In early literature, uh, from the beginning of modernity, we have seen that much of literature centered upon lower classes, uh, the underworld of cities. For example, in the 16th century or the Renaissance period, there was the city comedy or the citizen comedy, which focused on the London underworld. You know that with the Wasteland and Ulysses are connected to mythology and past in different ways. This underworld, which is the margin of the city, is the presence in um, these, uh, these modernist texts as well. Even when modernism centers, as I told you, on one character, it is the silenced margins that gets to speak. The flanier, James Joyce is a flanier, Leopold Bloom is a flanier, he is seeing life in so many different ways. There is criminality, there is vulgarity, there is failure, there is loss all around him and he is seeing it and coming to terms with it. Uh, investigating the sights, sounds, smells and textures of the urban spaces. Today we talk about all this in culture studies. We, get, we have got new perspectives, it's easier to understand. So how uh, Ulysses describes a place and space and the people who inhabit it. That is uh, what we should think of in connection to uh, Dublin. Joyce's Dublin is uh, very much the real Dublin, the, the real places. The uh, uh, Kiernan's pub, for example, is a very important place uh, that is there in Ulysses, uh, a setting that is there actually in Dublin. I, when, I, when, I, when, when I traveled in Dublin, in many uh, places, I saw the blue plaque which said, this is 
the place where you know england has preserved all that it's a very literary literature oriented country in many ways because they have preserved places where authors lived and places associated with texts etc in different ways so this is actually there and even when he is presenting the real dublin it is not the real dublin it is the dublin of the mind it is a surreal dublin also that we see dublin was a place where majority of people were uh, poor they lived in cramped uh, commercial spaces not that rich people were not there but rich people were uh, confined to some areas of dublin especially in those days and rich people sought to live in other uh, countrysides with big estates etc so dublin is all about squalor and poverty and struggle for survival in different ways uh, you can just move to the next to next slide yeah and uh, now uh, the text as you know um, the, the ulysses is more about the context uh, than the text that we can understand only if you know the context we can understand the text that is why i dwelt at length on the context the structure of uh, ulysses as you know is set in one day in 18 episodes it begins at 8 am with stephen in martello tower after a few episodes you see leopold bloom at 8 am he is living with his wife molly and he has a daughter milly who lives away he has a son who died uh, in infancy and this father son relationship uh, with relation to leopold bloom and his dead infant son is also very relevant here he is a father without a son he is seeking a son and here is stephen his mother has died and he is seeking a authority figure of father this father relation father uh, son relationship is representative of the search for authority that modernist man had search for meaning and center that the modernist man had at that time and uh, from 8 o'clock you see the day proceeding to um, 11 o'clock in a later slide at the end i have put the timeline of um, the text i i don't claim to have understood the text by reading it completely i have only read parts of the text i uh, have been unable to understand because it requires years to sit and understand completely it is more massive than the wasteland in a way so i got this timeline from somewhere and i just put it because it's useful from 8 o'clock to i i can share the full presentation with you if you want if you say anybody is interested uh, from 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock to noon then to evening to night then midnight and at 2 am they are uh, the, coming back home stephen has left martello tower he does not want to go back there and stay with his friends that night so he sees uh, leopold bloom and uh, goes back uh, goes to leopold bloom's house he is invited to stay there but he doesn't stay there this is how uh, the novel in a way ends and uh, Uh, what happens in in between the beginning and the ending it is uh, a multiple point of view uh, you know presentation narration of the human condition through all the characters through uh, the city of dublin we are looking at the daily lives and frustrations and uh, little little uh, experiences and joys etc of uh, these characters the structure is completely uh, broken up and fragmented because there are in some episodes first person narration in some epi- episodes third person in some episodes free- stream of consciousness there is an episode where new- newspaper headlines are coming there is a famous episode where um, so many there is it's an example of prestige so many different styles are uh, coming into play i have made a list of uh, the different sli- st- styles if you are interested um, there is an episode where he starts talking about uh, talking in the style of a latin translation this is episode number 14 the most difficult episode in the novel uh, he starts talking in the style of a latin translation then he switches to alliterative anglo saxon then he writes in the style of the medieval morality play every man then he writes in the 14th century writer john mandeville style in one episode a few pages and then he writes in the style of the diarist samuel peeps then writes in the style of daniel d4 then writes in the style of the tatler you see the variety you see the mind boggling uh, you know uh, 
uh, experimentation that is part of this novel. Then he is writing like Edmund Burke and David Hume, the philosophers. Then he is writing like Charles Lamb and Charles Dickens. And at the end of that episode, he is using various slangs. Oh my God, how can you hope to be such a scholar to understand all these things? This is so, so, so uh, playfully, uh, you know, uh, making fun of our expectations and our pretensions and our knowledges and our identities and existence. So in this uh, episode, you can see that Ulysses is like a great scholar gone crazy. He has uh, used, you know, the, there is no point in talking about the structure. It is everything that you can imagine the, and the style and structure, including uh, Celtic lyricism because he is Irish. As you know, Wales, uh, Wales, Ireland and Scotland are uh, predominantly Celtic in culture and uh, he has used that also. Next. Uh, it is just nothing. It's just main characters. You know it. Next. So there are three parts in Ulysses. Now let me briefly talk about the three parts. Uh, I, my intention is not to give you a summary because it is impossible. I just want to give you an experience of Ulysses. But I have a summary. If you want, I can give it to you. Part one of Ulysses is called Telemachied. Sorry, it's a mistake. It's Telemachied. That means the story of Telemachus. Now, let me tell you briefly the story of Odyssey, Odyssey by Homer. Uh, Odysseus was a Greek hero who, after the Trojan War, uh, 10 years of Trojan War took place. And after that, for 10 years, he is traveling back to Ithaca. At that time, his wife Penelope and Telemachus are in Ithaca. Penelope uh, was approached by their enemies in the guise of suitors and uh, she kept uh, postponing her second marriage saying I will marry once my wedding gown is finished and at night she would unravel whatever she had woven. Probably you know that it's called Penelope's web. Telemachus goes out in search of his father and uh, the first part of Odyssey is about Telemachus' search for his father. The second part of Odyssey is about Odysseus's wanderings. That is the big part and that is the big part in Ulysses also. Odysseus is wandering and meeting so many people. He is fighting them, getting imprisoned, so on and so forth. All that is, uh, you know, you know, paralleled in this novel. There are characters who are in a very ironic, funny manner paralleling the uh, Odyssey characters. And in the end, we have... Uh, Ulysses going back home, he is reaching home after his wanderings. But in the case of Odysseus, there was the chaste Penelope. In the case of Ulysses, there is his very unchaste wife uh, who has been having an affair with her manager. Don't think Ulysses or Leopold Bloom uh, is a very faithful man either. He is not. He, in, from the beginning episode, you see him hiding a love letter and then he gets a love letter. Henry Flower, that is the pseudonym he is using. Martha, one woman is writing very flirtatious letters to him and he is hoping to meet Martha. But it is frustrated, he doesn't meet her. So, uh, and there are many episodes where uh, his sexual desire is aroused. He sees a woman sitting in a carriage and he waits for her to get up so that he can catch a glimpse of her underwear. Can you imagine? Things like that. So, because this is what man is about, this is what human beings are. Why do you have to pretend that you are something else? This is the raw reality of human condition. And so the first part of Ulysses, which is in three episodes, uh, focus on Stephen Daedalus, a problematically autobiographical character. He is not out and out autobiographical. And um, he uh, is searching uh, metaphorically for a father. The three parts of the three episodes in part one are Telemachus, Nestor and Proteus. It is unnecessary for me to talk about the Homeric connections of each of these parts. I will just randomly mention a few because it's all there in Google. Um, Nestor is a you know, character who is very pompous and he is advising Odysseus and nothing is coming out of that advice. Like that there is a character Mr. DC in Ulysses. Stephen teaches in a boys school. At first he was teaching history, he was talking about a third century BC war which the boys have uh, no connection with. They are distracted and they are uh, not able to understand what he's teaching. After that he teaches Lycidas. I'm saying this because in net they, they might ask all these things. What is the poem that is being recited by 
uh, Stephen's students in Lycidas, that kind of questions, I mean, uh, in Ulysses, that kind of questions they ask. The questions apparently look like very factual and meaningless, but I suspect that the, these questions are objective correlatives for your knowledge. They want you to have deep knowledge and then answer these questions, that is why. So don't mug up MCQs. Anyway, uh, so Stephen is teaching in that school. After that lesson where he is teaching history and then uh, our Lycidas, he is going to meet the headmaster, Mr. DZ. Oh my God, he's a very funny man. He's completely misinformed. He, he mentions Shakespeare and uh, he pretends to be very learned. And he is an Anglo-Irish man who pretends to be very English. He doesn't like the Irish. He is praising the English all along. It is so funny. And uh, at the end, he wants Stephen to publish his letter that he has uh, written, a long letter that he has written, which, of which he is very proud about hoof and mouth disease of cattle. That is the letter and Stephen is going to the newspaper office to get it published. That is where he meets Leopold Bloom. So it is all based on the little, little, um, you know, uh, silliness, pettiness of life and what people are and uh, that is uh, Telemachiad. The next uh, part is Odyssey. As I told you, it is about the wanderings of Odysseus in Homer. It is about the wanderings of Leopold Bloom in uh, Ulysses. And uh, it has episodes from 4 to 15. And these 12 chapters are about uh, how meaningless and frustrated Joyce's life is. Will you please change the slide? You can see the uh, episodes are again titled after the uh, sections of Odyssey. Let me remind you that these titles were not there in the original publication. It was, it was added later. I think uh, it is a little melodramatic that these titles have been added. It, maybe uh, it would have done better without the title, but then it would have become even more obscure. It would have been easy for us to understand anything. Uh, Calypso, the Lotus Eaters. I will just mention things that we are familiar with. The Lotus Eaters is about uh, lotus eaters of you, the sailors getting intoxicated, we all know that. That whole episode is about intoxicating things that the characters are going through. You know, that kind of connection is there uh, throughout. For example, women. And then Hades is the episode where Leopold Bloom is going to attend the funeral of Paddy Dignam. One person has died and he is going to attend the funeral. And uh, Hades is the other word, word for the underworld. And you see what lies beyond the death, the underside of life in this episode, Hades. Then Aeolus, Lestrigonians, Scylus and Charybdis. I'm not going into it because it is past my time and uh, it will be very tedious to discuss all this in great detail. Uh, sirens, are you moving? Yeah. Sirens are women who, um, you know, uh, Change, you, who just uh, destroyed the men with their singing. There's a lot of reference to music and singing in that chapter. And um, then we move on to the third part of Nostos. Nostos means return. Leopold Bloom is uh, returning to Ulysses. Have you moved? Yes. Have returned to Molly Bloom. And there are three episodes in Nostos. And the last episode is important. It is a monologue of Penelope. It is a monologue of uh, Molly Bloom. It is called Molly's uh, Soliloquy. And I'm just going to end in a little bit. Molly is thinking about both Blazes Boylan and uh, Leopold Bloom. And she is once again in bed. And, uh, uh, you know, Leopold Bloom, no, Leopold Bloom is in bed and he resents, she resents giving him breakfast. Whereas in the first uh, beginning 8, 8 a.m. we had seen Leopold Bloom taking breakfast to Molly and very importantly Leopold Bloom had gone out to the butchers and bought pork kidney for his breakfast. It is said famously that he had kidney in his mind and potato in his pocket. He walks about in London with a potato in his pocket. It is a symbol for his luck. It is a very down-to-earth uh, you know practice uh, walking about with a potato, that is what he is, he is not a hero, he is not in any way uh, unlike you and me with frustrations and uh, all kinds of troubles. So we see that 
Leopold Bloom knows about Molly's, um, uh, you know, affair because she's hiding the letter from Blazes Boylan under the pillow, etc. But he's still very fond of her. In Ulysses, in Finnegan's Wake, and even in the Wasteland, we see sexual disdemeanor and the grie uh, grieved party is actually coming to terms with it. Leopold Bloom is doing nothing against Molly. It is like normal that Leopold is having his affairs and Molly is having her affairs. There is no, what is the expectation from life and marriage and uh, relationships? It is completely subverted here. And lastly, uh, next slide please. There is a timeline of events which I don't want to go into. In case uh, you are interested, I can share with you this as I told you. And uh, then I have talked about the mythical method. Let me briefly su summarize this. It was T.S. Eliot in his review of Ulysses called Ulysses Order and Myth. Uh, that, uh, it was he who talked about the mythical method of the modernist. The modernist writer is facing an anarchy in front of him. And the use of myth will bring an order and a meaning to quote T.S. Eliot, to bring a shape and a significance to this immense panorama of futility and anarchy that is contemporary history. That is what um, uh, mythical method means. This contemporary history is anarchy and this anarchy can be sh given a shape using uh, myth. There are many parallels with Homer which uh, I am not reading. I have already talked about it in uh, different ways. Once again, Telemachus is Stephen, Leopold Bloom is Odysseus, and Molly Bloom is Penelope. The characters become more vivid and meaningful. Their quest and journey becomes like universal because of the mythical matrix into which they are positioned. This is, it is because of the mythical method probably that we are able to connect with these characters even more. And there are so many connections with Freud and Jung and, uh, you know, contemporary philosophy, not only contemporary, ancient to contemporary philosophy that you can see uh, in Ulysses. Ulysses is a satire on modernity. This most difficult text that you can imagine is the most hilarious text that you can also imagine. Every sentence, every bit of it is full of ironic subversions and punning and uh, making fun of so many things and it is like a satire on modernity. Once again, uh, let me remind you, what is modern life about? Next, Ulysses effectively brings alive the dehumanization that we still experience. Human being has no value. Human expectations and desires are always frustrated. The stasis or paralysis that the modern city is about. You can only like uh, that, um, you know, that rat, in, that mouse inside the cage, I, I forget what it is called. You can only go round and round and round uh, Dublin. You can go round and round and round your own life, your own, uh, you know, identity. You are not getting anywhere. The metaphor of our endless wanderings and compromises. All of you are sitting here. I am also sitting here because of our wanderings and desire to be somewhere else. I want, uh, you know, you to listen to me because I want to build my image. You want to listen to me because you want to pass exams and understand literature and have a career. We are all in a quest of some sort or the other. The everyday ordinary life and its complexities. That is what we are also dealing with uh, on a daily basis. A it is at the same time a world without borders. There is nothing that Ulysses is incapable of showing us. It is like everything is there in Ulysses. Everything is possible. Even when Ulysses presents a bleak picture, there is also a kind of postmodern hope. There is a postmodern liberation that you experience because postmodernism is there in modernism. Postmodernism is not something different from modernism. There is also, even when there is a bleak uh, lament for modernity and its loss of values, etc. There is also a liberating energy that you can get from Ulysses. Uh, and that is the note on which I want to end this presentation because everything is possible. Everything is literature. Every one of us has a place in this world and everything is ourselves. The last slide is a quote from Ulysses. We walk through ourselves, meeting robbers, Today, we walked and you came here and met robbers 
ghosts, giants, isn't it? Are, that is what we all are, uh, surreal characters, pretending to be normal human beings. We walk through ourselves, meeting robbers, ghosts, giants, old men, young men, wives, widows, brothers in love, but always meeting ourselves. So I hope in today's uh, two presentations, one lecture uh, and my presentation, you met yourselves. Happy being yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon to one and all present here. On behalf of the Department of English and the organizing team, I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. My heart is filled with immense gratitude and respect for our distinguished guest, Dr. Kalyani Vallath, for not only sparing her invaluable time for us to grace this occasion, but also for enlightening us with her commendable talk on the great masterpiece and self-reflection. Dr. Vallath needs no formal introduction as we all are well aware of how her passionate and determined ways of teaching have radically transformed the phase of English learning. Primarily known as an edupreneur, she is the director of TES, Total English Solutions, and the institution's reputation precedes her as the number of students who fly from around the country to be a part of it is a testimony in itself. Her classes never have a vacancy, which is unfortunate for the rest of us. While browsing the internet to find more about Kalyani Ma'am, I came across a comment by a student who wrote, if you want to know about her teaching, then I can only explain it in one word, heaven. I am sure that the audience here agrees to it, and it as it was indeed a very blissful opportunity to hear her speak today. The student body is going to manifest similar symposiums because it was very influential. Moving forward, I would like to thank our principal, Dr. Saji Stephen, head of the department, Praveena Thompson, and Dr. T.K. Rajendran Sir for curating this wonderful seminar for us today. I would also like to extend my gratitude to all the teachers and other dignitaries who blessed the program with their support and presence. Last but not the least, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the audience for making this seminar a grand success through their kindly and enthusiastic cooperation. Thank you.